Our passage today comes from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 27 through 31. Isaiah 40. Now it's, Devin, you mentioned sometimes we go through some stuff, right? That was the prompting for the song of Jesus. Sometimes it can get difficult for us, right, in our lives. We go through some stuff. We go through tough stuff, hard stuff. And sometimes we do wonder why. Well, the story of Job, are you familiar with the story of Job, right? Yeah. The story of Job starts off, it starts off in the court of heaven, in God's court. And God is there, the angels are there, and Satan comes in, and he, he's, God says, hey, what you been up to? Well, to and fro about the earth. Well, hey, God says, have you considered my servant Job? Well, Job was a righteous man. He interceded for his family. He prayed for his family. He did right. He was, he was in a good relationship with God. And so God says, hey, have you considered my servant Job? So I was like, yeah, but I can't touch him. You've been protecting him too well. I can't get to him. But I tell you what, Satan says, if, if you just remove your hand of protection over him, let me go after him, he's going to turn on you and he's going to curse you. God says, okay, I'll allow it. So Satan goes and he takes away all of Job's wealth, Job's fortune, Job's family even. And yet Job did not curse God. He says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so again, court of heaven, Satan's there. God says, hey, have you considered my servant Job? Yeah, 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 yeah. He hasn't turned on you yet, but let me touch him. Let me affect his actual life. And God's like, okay, I'll allow it. Just don't kill him. So Satan attacks Job's body physically with sores and boils and pains and all sorts of bad stuff. And yet Job still doesn't curse God. Through all his troubles, through all this pain, through all this turmoil, he doesn't turn his back on God. He wonders where God's at. He wonders what's going on, but he doesn't question God. He doesn't, as far as turning his back on God, he doesn't curse God. Job's friends come and for, they sit there for several days. And eventually they start speaking and says, Job, what did you do? What did you do? Because, and this is the way they thought, bad things don't happen to good people. If bad, something bad happens to you, you brought it on yourself. Sometimes it's true, right? But is it always true? No. And that's the story of the book of Job. Throughout the, the whole book of Job, for 30-something chapters, it's Job's friends and Job having a conversation, and they're all like, Job, what did you do? And Job's like, I didn't do anything. I don't have any unconfessed sin. I've gone to God. I make sacrifices. I do all this stuff. I have, I'm, I'm good. I don't know why this is happening. I don't know where God's at. I don't know when God's going to bring justice. But I know he's going to redeem me one day. I mean, he's going to resurrect me one day. There's going to be a time when there's not this. But right now, I don't know what's going on. I'm in pain. I've got all this going on. And you're wrong. Eventually, God does show up. And because Joseph says, hey, God, give me an audience. Hear from me. Let me hear from you. Why is this happening? Well, God shows up and he basically says, I'm God. Who are you to question me? I created everything. I created this. I control this. I do this. I do this. He never tells Job why. Never. If you read the book of Job, Job doesn't know the situation in heaven. He doesn't know about Satan and what Satan said. He doesn't know that that's what's going on. And God never tells him. But at the end of the book, God said this much. He said, Job, you were right. In everything you said, you were right. Your friends are wrong. <laughs> but you were right. And God turn, comes back and he blesses Job with more than he had before. But throughout all that time, Job was patient. Job endured his suffering, looking forward to the time when it was going to be through, still maintaining that trust in God and yet still wondering why. The New Testament talks about the patience of Job, in his, especially in a bad, bad situation. But the message of the book of Job is that bad things do happen to good people. And we don't know why God allows it. We don't know why God does things. We don't know why, why it happens, but we know that sometimes, even if we're right with God, things happen. And the New Testament is clear, especially when we're right with God, bad things are going to happen to us. One, we live in a fallen world, 
We're a fallen humanity. Sometimes we bring bad things on ourselves. Sometimes it's because of the actions of other people, right? They, they bring things on us. Anybody ever wronged you? Done something to hurt you? Maybe not physically, but maybe emotionally or, or mentally? Or somebody, what somebody else did affect you? We live in a fallen world with fallen humanity. Bad things happen. They just do. And while they might not be caused by God, God will turn those things to good. We talked about that over in uh, Romans 8. He works all things together for good for those who love him. But we don't always understand it. We don't always see it. Bad things happen. And when bad things happen to us, When we face that reality of suffering in our lives, of troubles and problems and difficulties, and especially when they go on and on and on, it seems, it can get easy to feel abandoned by God. We question, God, where are you at? Why are you allowing this? What is going on here? And we're not hearing from God. At least we don't feel like we're hearing from God. And we feel abandoned by him. You ever been there? You're going through some dark days. God, where are you at? Why are you letting this happen to me? What is going on? Well, our passage today addresses this feeling. And what we're going to see in Isaiah chapter 41 verses, uh, 40, verses 27 through 31, is that when we feel abandoned by God, we need to remember who He is, what He does and is doing, and knowing that when we're on our own, we're, we're trying, trusting in our own strength, we're going to stumble, right? We're going to mess up, we're going to fall. But when we wait on God, He is going to give us the strength to not just endure our suffering, but to overcome our difficulties. So Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice do me escapes the notice of my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Now, the people of Israel... They went into exile, remember that? And the reason they went into exile was that there was the divided kingdom, but they they stopped following after God and they started doing their own thing, worshiping other gods. And so the northern kingdom of Israel was taken off by Assyria into captivity, into exile. The southern kingdom of Judah, they had good kings and they had bad kings and they had good kings. You know, it's a cycle. And it just kept getting worse and worse. And finally God says, enough. And so they're sent into exile. For 70 years, Imagine their feeling, right? God, where are you at? I know we brought this on ourselves, but where are you at? But did God forget them? No, he didn't. He he preserved a remnant and he brought them back to the promised land, brought them back to the land he had promised them. But even then, they weren't free. They still had to exist under the control of foreign powers. And so it's easy. God, where are you at? Think about the 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. God, where are you at? Why are you still allowing this? Why, why haven't you kept your promises? The people of Israel at times felt abandoned. It looks like we've lost hope. Oh, that power back? <laughs> Talking about strength and power today, so the strength and power of God. Now, the people of Israel felt abandoned, and so we see this captured in this verse here, in the first verse 27. And the prophet's asking, Why do you say, O Jacob, assert, O Israel? And he says, Why, why are you saying these things? And what are they saying? My way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice do me escapes the notice of my God. God, where are you at? Why are you seeing my troubles? Are you even seeing my troubles? God, are you even paying attention? Do you even care? We, sometimes we have we felt those questions when we're going through tough times. Maybe it's, we know God is paying attention, but God, when are you going to step up? When are you going to make it right? When are you going to bring about justice? When the going gets rough and it keeps on getting rough, it's easy for those questions to come into our mind, right? Sometimes it's just the doubts of the flesh. Sometimes it's the whispers of the enemy and the lies of the enemy coming against us. But it's easy to feel abandoned. 
And when we start feeling abandonment, when we, if we give in to that feeling, well, we can be tempted to try to make things easy for us, right? To, to not rock the boat. To not stand up for Jesus when it, when it concerns things about living for him. When we face that peer pressure from others who are affecting our lives and influencing us just to, just to give up and to say, okay, God, I'm done, I'm tired, I'm weary, I'm, I'm fatigued, I'm done with this. It's easy to give in or to take shortcuts. But here's the thing about shortcuts. Sometimes the shortcuts are not the best route to take. They're not the best route to take. You'd be traveling down a highway and get there faster. But you say, oh, but this way's shorter. Yeah, but you, only, you can only drive like 35 miles per hour on it, right? You ever been down those roads? All right, it seems like a shortcut. The road looks smooth, but it's actually about a mile. It just gets all bumpy and rocky and curvy and everything else. Yeah, that's what shortcuts do. And so we can be tempted to take those shortcuts when we feel abandoned, to give in to that feeling. But that's not what we're supposed to do. And so these verses tell us how or what we need to know to overcome that feeling of being abandoned. Because guess what? Our feelings... They lie to us, right? Because even though we may feel abandoned, God has not abandoned us. He's not distant. He's not far off. He is right near us. He has not abandoned us, even though we might feel like it. Job felt abandoned, but he knew he wasn't. We need to do this. So there's several things in this passage that we need to know. First of all, we need to know and to remember who God is. right? And who is God? Verse 28. Do you not know, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. First of all, it says here, he is the everlasting God. He is the God who transcends time. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He was there before creation and he has always existed. He will always exist And you know what that means since he transcends time? He's everlasting. He's not bound by our timetable, right? He's not bound by our method of keeping time. What seems like a long time for us is just but a blip in all of eternity, right? He's everlasting. So that also means that, guess what? He's seen all of humanity has, or he knew it all before he created this. But what you're going through, he sees what you've done and what's been done to you. He's seen what you're going through. He's seen it all. He knows the future. He knows the past. God is not caught unaware by your troubles. God is not caught unaware. Sometimes we can feel like, feel like that, right? That, okay, God, did this catch, this catch you by surprise? No, it didn't. God is not surprised by anything that we do. He is the everlasting God. But he's also the personal God. Notice there it says, the everlasting God, the Lord. And your translation might have Lord in small caps there. That means it's translating God's name. It's, it's Yahweh. They put Adonai. They said Adonai. It means Lord. But it's for God's name. God's name is Yahweh. Related to the great I am. Remember that? Moses says, well, who shall I tell them to send me? I am that I am. The God who exists. But this is God's name. God is a personal God. And we need to remember that. He is not some distant, uncaring father or brutal father who subjects us to bad things and abuse. No, he is a loving and a good God. A God who cares for us. He established a relationship with the people of Israel back in the Old Testament. And he establishes a relationship with us through Jesus. When we trust in Jesus, we are brought into a relationship with God as our loving, caring Father. So when you're going through tough times, God knows what you're going through. Jesus is well aware of suffering. Think about all that Jesus went through. He was abandoned by people. He had people turn on him. He had people betray him. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was crucified. He faced opposition. He was killed. God knows what you're going through. He has experienced it himself. So when you're going through difficult times, remember who God is. He's an eternal God. He is a God who is in a personal relationship with you, if you have trusted in Jesus. He's also the creator. It says they're the creator of the ends of the earth. Remember the story from Genesis chapter 1? God 
created the heaven. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything that exists, God created. And how do you know? He says, and let there be. Let there be light. Let there be this. He just spoke things into existence out of nothing. Material out of nothing. Created out of thin air. Except there wasn't even air at the time either. He created everything. Over in John chapter 1, it says he created everything by the word, talking about Jesus. All things came into being through Jesus the word. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Colossians 1.16 says, it's not just physical, this is everything. Not just, not just the stars and the planets and the heavens and the, and the earth and everything on it. But all things, spiritual and physical. Colossians 1.16, for by him, talking about Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Everything, spiritual, physical, everything answers to God as creator. Satan will one day answer to God because God created him. And he turned his back on God. Everything answers to God. Everything answers to God who spoke them into existence. Who created them. Who formed them. We will answer to God too. Because we were created through Jesus and for him too. Everything was created for Jesus. And the God who created has the power, the strength, the ability to do... If he has the ability to do that just by speaking a word, he has the power, ability, and strength to step into our lives. God is not caught unaware, but God is not also powerless in the face of this. He is not overwhelmed by what we go through. When we are overwhelmed, God is not. When we fall and stumble and we lack the strength, God has it. He can and he will step into our lives. And he has the power to do so. And we need to trust in that power. The last thing about what we need to go about who God is, is that it says his understanding is inscrutable. His ways are higher than ours. His understanding is higher than ours. Romans 11.33, Paul puts it this way. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and unfathomable his ways. We can only see what we have the ability to see. Right? Even just think about it, our visible light, light spectrum, Roy G. Biv, right? Red, orange, yellow, blue, indigo, violet. We have that, that spectrum of colors. That's what our eyes can see. We can't see infrared. Sound, we can't hear infra ultrasound because we, are only, we can only hear certain things. We can only perceive what we have the ability to see. And our vision is always limited. It's limited to our circumstances. It's limited to what's around us. But God created it all. He sees it all, right? He knows it all. We don't. And when we're going through difficult times, when we're suffering, when we have problems, guess what? Our vision narrows down. It's like blinders are being put on, and we can only see our problem. I've been there. You can only see your problem. You, you forget kind of everything else going on, and you're focused in on that. So can we trust what we see? Not really. We can't really trust what we see because our vision is limited. We don't know all that's going on, but God does. He understands everything. Our perception is this, and his is this. Narrow, ours. God sees it all. God knows it all. He knows what's going on. He knows what you're going through. And he's, he knows the outcome of what you're going through. We can't even see the outcome of our actions. We can say, okay, if I do this, this will happen. Sometimes we're right. But we can't see all the ramifications generations later because of our actions. But God does. That's why it says God works all things together for good to those who love God. <coughs> He's got his plan and he's working his plan. No matter what the enemy throws at him, no matter how we mess up, God has factored it in. And so we need to trust in God when it comes to that. So we need to remember when we're going through tough times, when we're feeling abandoned, who God is. He is the everlasting God. He is a personal God. He is the creator God who doesn't get tired, right? I kind of skipped over that little part earlier. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't lose strength. He's got the power. 
the ability, the strength to do what he wants to do. And he's going to do what he wants to do, and he's going to work it out in our lives, even though we might not see it. We might not even understand it. Did Job understand what he was going through? No. The story of Job, he didn't get told why. We see why, but he didn't understand it. And so we need to trust in God. Remember who he is. The next thing we need to remember to, to understand when it comes to overcoming the feeling of abandonment that we sometimes have when we're going through tough times, and even we need to remember what God does. Verse 29. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Now, there are different words here for strength and the lack of strength here, and they're very much synonyms. They kind of have the same idea. And I think one reason God does this is to show how all-encompassing his power, his strength is when we fail, when we mess up, right? When we grow tired or weak, he gives strength. When we're fatigued and overwhelmed, he gives us power. When we don't feel like we can do anything that we can put one foot in front of the other, he gives us the ability to do so. God gives strength. And Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 talks about this. Finally, towards the end, one of his finallys, not much longer to go, but it's close. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Three different words for being strength, uh, being uh, strong, being uh, strengthened there. Three different words. And so in our understanding, you know, we kind of think of all the same thing. But to kind of nuance these words a bit, to draw out their nuances, their, their kind of the differences in them to help us understand this, we might translate it this way. Finally, be filled with strength. Because that's the idea of being be strong, be strengthened. Be filled with with strength by the Lord and in the all-encompassing power of his absolute and always ready might. God's power is absolute. No one is stronger than him. And it comes from within himself. It doesn't come from outside of himself. And God is always ready to show that power, to show that authority, to show that strength and to, to give it because we need to be filled. We cannot, we're not strong enough. We're not strong enough. We need to be filled. Now, why do we need to be filled? Verse uh, 30 tells us, Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous, young men stumble badly. Those, those who have strength are going to lose it. They might think you have it all together, but you're going to stumble. Because under our own strength, we just don't have it. We don't have enough strength. Now, when I was a kid, you know, youths here, when I was a kid, I could stay up all night and be fine the next day, but the day after that, guess what was going to happen? I was going to crash. It's, it's the truth. Even though you might think you have all the strength in the world, you might find that it's not enough. You're going to find that it's not enough. Now, more often I like to watch the, the History Channel show alone. Are you familiar with that show? So the theme, if you're not, is 10 contestants are, are taken. They're all survival experts. You know, they know how to live off the land. And so they're taken and they're isolated in different spots in an area, so they're not close to each other. And the goal is to survive. Basically, whoever lasts the longest wins. Because if, you, if you, something happens, you can tap out, you're out, you don't get the 50000 Is it 50000 500000 This season, it's like $500,000. This season, they're 125 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Winter is coming in and you have to survive. Now, there are several people that we thought were going to last a lot longer than they did. But what took them out? Sometimes it was injury. Sometimes it was illness. And so they radioed, I need to be, I'm tapping out, I need to get out. And then sometimes it's the psychological aspect. You're all alone with your thoughts. All you have is a camera stuff and you have some limited items, but you're by yourself. You are truly alone. So some people, the psycho psychological aspect gets to them. Some people, it's just they, they miss their family. They realize that humans were created for community. And it's true, we are. We're not meant to live life alone. But no matter how much you know, no matter how strong you are, something is going to come along that makes you tap out. Or for us, makes us want to spiritually tap out. Say, okay, God, I'm just done with this. I, I can't. Because I like strength. This is why God gives us strength. We need His strength. And so how do we do that? 
How, do, how are we filled with God's strength? How does God give his strength to us? Verse 31. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. In essence, how are we filled with strength? We wait on the Lord. And he does these things. He lets us mount up and soar like eagles, right? Above the situation. He gives us strength to, to run and to not grow tired or weary. And he lets us walk. And, so, and we don't get tired that way. Whatever the situation is, we can get through to the end of it because God gives us strength when we wait on him. Now, do you like waiting? I don't like waiting. I really don't like waiting. But then again, our whole society doesn't like waiting, doesn't we? We're an instant society. We have information on our phones, access, immediate. We can look up anything with Google or other search engines, right? We don't know something, we can look it up. If we have a good cell signal or internet at least. We have instant noodles, right? Instant oatmeal. We can cook things in the microwave in minutes where that might take hours if we cooked it on the stove or in the oven. We don't like waiting. We have fast food for a reason, right? And then when, when we're inconvenienced anyway, when it takes longer, we're like, what's the hold up? We don't like waiting. But oftentimes we get a, the wrong idea of waiting, though. Because sometimes when we're waiting, we just think about we're not doing anything, right? We're kind of sitting there or twiddling our thumbs. We're doing something mindless or doom scrolling on Facebook or Twitter or what have you. We're not really accomplishing anything. But that's the wrong idea of waiting. We oftentimes think of waiting as something that's passive. We're just here. We're just sitting. We're just waiting. But that's not the way waiting is supposed to be. Waiting is actually an activity. We call you know, wait staff, waiting, that sort of thing. It's not just doing nothing. So how do we go about waiting? Well, one thing we need to remember about waiting is the, the problem with waiting is that when we're doing it, we can get discouraged, right? We can think, you know, it's that feeling of abandonment. We, we get discouraged. We, we can lose heart as scripture talks about it. We want to give up. So how do we wait? How do we wait when nothing seems to be happening? When God doesn't seem to be doing anything, because he is, we just don't perceive it. How do we do it? Well, there's three things that I think we, we should do, and these are not the only things, but these are kind of encompass a lot of it. The first thing that we need to do is we need to keep on praying. <clears throat> when we're going through tough times, when we're feeling like we're not hearing from God, when we're feeling like we're abandoning God, we don't need to give up. We need to keep on praying praying. Over in Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells a parable for this point. Starting in Luke 18 verse 1, verses 1 through 8. Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. To not give in to that feeling of abandonment. S saying, in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city and she kept coming to him saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continual coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? When we're tempted to give up and give in, we need to go back to God. When we're feeling abandoned, we need to remember that God hasn't abandoned us, who he is, what he does, and we go to him in prayer, seeking his strength, seeking his power to not just, over, not just to endure, but to overcome our situation. It says he, God does not tarry long. Remember, his timetable is not our timetable, though. It might not be when we want it, but it's going to be when it's just right. God acts when it's just right for him to act. He arrives precisely when he means to. To quote Gandalf, but anyways. We go to God in prayer. We seek him. We seek his face. We come to him when life seems hard. And so we keep on praying. He's going to step in. He's going to do something. He's always at work. He hasn't stopped working. So we go to God in prayer. 
Because that's our communication with God. That's our talk with our Heavenly Father who loves us, who cares for us, who wants to intercede for us and step into our lives and give us the strength. But we've got to turn to Him for that strength. The second thing is we need to keep on trusting in Jesus. When we're waiting, we can sometimes get antsy and impatient and want to do things on our own, under our own power, do it my way rather than God's way. But then we're showing trust in ourself. We're trying to trust in ourself and not trust in God. Not trusting in his strength. We're trusting in ours. Over in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul talks about keeping heart or not losing heart. And he says it's because of what he knows Jesus is going to do. He knows that Jesus is working over in 2 Corinthians 4. And it's really it's verses 7 through, you know, really 7 through 18, but there's more than that. But we're not going to look at all those verses. But just a few verses out of there to kind of emphasize this point. Verse 7. But we have this treasure in earth and vessels, the knowledge of the glory of God, Paul's ministry of glory and mercy. He has received mercy so he doesn't lose heart. But we have this treasure in earth and vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. God works in weakness. His, as he says later in over him, my strength is perfected in weakness. Because that way we know, guess who it's from? It's not of us. It's from God. We are afflicted in every way, Paul continues, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. We go through things so that God's power, His might, His strength is shown in our lives. We might not understand why God is doing it, but we can know that God is going to show up and He's going to work through it. And other people, if we're trust, if we're waiting on God, we're continuing to pray for God, we're trusting in God, God's going to show up and shine through. Goes on in verse 13, but having the same spirit of faith, there's that trust. According to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke also, we also believe, therefore we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sake, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Paul is trusting that God is working in his situation. That inspires him. Verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Paul faced some tough circumstances, didn't he? Beatings, stonings, shipwrecked. You name it, Paul experienced it. If anybody had a reason to kind of want to give up, Paul did. But did he? No, he didn't lose heart because he knew what God had done for him through Jesus. He knew what God was doing through him and he knew what God was going to do. He might not have known every aspect of every situation, but he says, I know, I'm trusting that Jesus is working and he's going to see me through to the other side. God's got a plan and he's working out that plan. And I'm trusting in Jesus because that's the only way so I can see the end of that plan. So we need to keep on trusting in Jesus. And the third thing that we need to do to, when we're waiting on God to work and to move is that we need to keep on serving Him. Because when we feel abandoned, when we feel like God isn't listening to us, when we feel when our perception is limited, we can't just sit idly. Waiting on God is not sitting there twiddling our thumbs saying, okay, God, when are you going to work? Because God has told us that we are to be doing we're to be living. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Sometimes it seems that when we're doing good, but no good's coming out of it, just kind of want to give up. You're trying to touch people. You're trying to reach in their lives. You're trying to, to, to work on them, to share God with them. And they just, you're just like hitting a wall. You just kind of want to give up. Sometimes the good that we do, it doesn't seem like there's any result from it. I'm pouring myself out into this and there's seemingly no result. Seemingly, remember, our perception is limited. And so we're not to lose heart. 
We're to keep on serving God. We were created to do this. For we are his work, which have created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Ephesians 2.10. God created us to work. We are to shine our light, right? We're to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That's what we're to be. We're to be showing God's love, his grace, his glory in our lives. And we're not to stop doing that. Even when the world is crashing against us, when we have an enemy who is surrounding us, when we're, seeing, we're overwhelmed with what's going on, we're to keep on keeping on. And God is the one who gives us the strength to do that. This is what we are to do. So when we're waiting on God, we're not sitting there. We're not sitting idle. We've got to keep on praying. We've got to keep on trusting in Jesus. And we need to keep on serving God. We need to keep on working for him. Good works don't save us. But we are saved for good works. To show God's work in our lives. To show his strength in our lives. And when we're at our weakest, guess what? God is at his strongest. He's pouring it out in our lives. When we do these things, when we pray, when we're trusting in Jesus, when we're keeping on serving, God gives us the strength to endure and not just to endure our circumstances. Not just to get through them, but to overcome them. Victorious. Spiritually victorious in our lives. He is a good God. He is strong and he is powerful. And our situations are no match for him, right? Our situations aren't bigger than he is. Our difficulty is not going to wear him out. It's not going to tire him. We're not going to sap him of strength. Our troubles... Don't stand a chance. But we gotta wait on God. We gotta wait for the Lord. Praying, trusting, and serving Him. Now, in just a moment, we're gonna have a, a time of response. God is working in your life right now. You may not feel it, you might not be aware of it, but God is working right now. And the Holy Spirit lives in you. If you're trusting in Jesus, you've got the Holy Spirit, you've got God in you, and He is always working. He's always working to renew us and to strengthen us because we need that strength. But remember, when we're going through tough times, when we're feeling abandoned by God, if we give into that feeling, we're not going to experience God's strength for us. The strength He wants to give us. The power He wants to put into our lives. So I ask you, is there anything going on in your life Anything in your lives that are keeping you distant from God? Is there any sin that is unconfessed? Anything that's keeping you from trusting in God? Are there any doubts that you're feeling? Any fears? Because sometimes it's what's going to happen in the future that gets us. It's not what's happened in the past. It's not what's happening now. It's what's in the future. Go to God with. He wants to hear from you. He wants to give you strength. He wants to pour out his love, his grace, his mercy, and his power on you. But you got to get right with him. you got to be with him first. And he's going to do that for you. Now, if you're here and you haven't trusted in Jesus, you haven't given your life to him, you cannot experience this power, this strength until you do so. you got to be a member of God's family. You've got to be saved you got to be born again however it's phrased you got to be in a relationship with god your sins have to be taken care of and they can be if you trust in jesus you go to him you ask his forgiveness you give your life to him he will come in he will forgive you he will cleanse you and he will give you the strength to live for him and if you're a believer this is a daily reminder because this is a daily thing to wait on god and i've been guilty of wasting my time Twiddling my thumbs, doom scrolling on Facebook, you know, wasting my time. Maybe you're in the same boat. You got to remember, waiting is not just sitting still. It's trusting in God. It's serving God. And it's continuing to talk with God, even when we don't feel like it. God is aware. He knows. So whatever God is laying on your heart, give it to him. Maybe he's telling you to do something. Say yes to it. It means you've got to say no to everything else. You've got to even say no to yourself. You've got to say yes to God. So let's pray. 
Almighty God and Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you now and we, Lord, you are a good, strong God. You love us, you care for us, and you are more than willing to step into our lives and work. And so, Lord, we pray that you would do so. Take out any hindrance, take out any roadblocks that keep us from coming to you. Lord, thank you for your care. Thank you for your love and your provision and your goodness. Lord, we pray that you would just keep working in our lives. Help us to wait on you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.